Hey everybody and welcome to another video from the Electronic Armory. In this video we're going to talk about Google's recent announcement during Google I.O. today, specifically about Android, Android Studio, and the announcement that Kotlin will be a first-class citizen in the world of Android development. Unlike sites that are simply reporting on this, we'll dive down deeper and explore the technical pieces in more details. Let's talk about Android Studio first. So I actually loaded this up in a, another project, a very large project that, that I work on, and the only issue that I had with upgrading to the Android Studio 3.0 is this warning that I got in the Gradle build. So when I converted the Gradle build file over to the new system that both Android Studio has and the new Gradle plugin that they have uh, included with that Android Studio version, I got a weird error about all flavors must now be named flavor dimensions. So luckily Google linked to this particular page here all I had to do was add this line to my Gradle build file, and then of course include this in each one of our, our different builds. So we had one for staging, one for production. Uh, if you if you want more information about this and this comes up, definitely look into the help that, that Android Studio links to. Okay, so how do you get the latest version of Android Studio, which is 3.0 with a preview one? Most of you are probably familiar, but you go up to the Android Studio, you can say check for new versions, if new new versions come up, it'll say that you can change the channel, change it to Canary, and you can get the latest Canary build of this. So what's different in Android Studio 3? Well, if you go up to new and start a new project, we have a couple new things in here, namely that we now have a new checkbox to include Kotlin support. So when you're starting a new project, uh, we have the ability to include Kotlin support so you can start your new projects using Kotlin right out of the gate. So this is really, really cool, but let's say you already have a project like most of us do that already rely on old Java. So I have this just basic example project here that I have, and you can see that it's in Java. Well, if we wanted to convert this over to Kotlin, we don't have to do very much. We can just go up to code and say, convert Java file to Kotlin. But you can give this a shot and work out any errors or any other kind of runtime errors that you run into. Uh, your mileage would vary and do remember that this is a preview version so not everything's guaranteed to work. So we get a little dialog box that says some code in the rest of the project may require corrections after performing this conversion. I, I do have other files in this little tiny example application. And so it's asking me, do you want to find such code and correct it too? Yeah, sure, that sounds great. Great, and that's all it took. And so if you wanna try out Kotlin with your projects, uh, do remember to keep it in source control. So if you wanna revert back to uh, the Java version, then you can simply do that if something goes wrong. Uh, of course, um, but I encourage you to take a take a look at this. My prediction is that Google has been trying to get away from Java for a very long time. Uh, they've had some issues with the owners of Java in the past, and so this is signaling to me that they are ready to move on to a new language and try something else. And so what, what I think they're doing is they're kind of giving it a test run to see if whether developers will adopt it and then start building applications in it. And if so, I think what they're going to do is let Java slowly die out on the Android platform as Kotlin takes over. I've been hearing about Kotlin a lot. Uh, I've been looking into it and it to me, if you look at the code on the screen right now, it looks a lot like Swift. And if you've been following any of my previous videos on iOS or anything like that, you may understand that this is pretty close to Swift. So let's take a little deeper dive into Kotlin and see what we're talking about. Great, so if you go to kotlinlang.org, and I'll put all these links in the video's description below, but if you go here and you can look up the basic syntax of Kotlin. So just like Java, we have a package with a definition and we can import other packages into this class. And then if you go down, instead of having um, you know these functions, we have a keyword fun. Well, that sounds fun, but that just short for function. And then we have this example function called sum, and it's going to take a parameter a, which is of type int, and b, also of type int, and it's gonna take those two parameters, do something with them, and then return another int. And so what does it do with it? It just adds those together in a sum, of course, returns that. And so this is how we now define the parameters, each one, and the return value. Okay, and then we have a slightly different way of writing that function, which is very interesting to me, but it, there is no return value. It is simply just, this is what this function equals. It is the sum of a plus b. So scrolling down a little bit more, we have the different 
types of declarations that we can have for variables. Uh, val, we have a value called a, which is of type integer, and that's going to be assigned the number one. Now these do not change. If you want to change these values, if I wanted to you know, change a to two or some other number, what I'd have to do instead is declare it as a variable or a var. And so this it gives us the availability to mutate or make it a mutable variable and change its value. So if you wanted to go from x equals 5 to x plus 1, then we have to make it a var. Comments are pretty much the same. Single line comments are denoted with a double forward slash and multi-line comments are a forward slash star ended with a star forward slash. Pretty typical if you're used to Java. All right, what is very different from Java is the way that we uh, put in these different values into a string. Uh, and so this is just denoted by a dollar sign curly brace for functions, but just the dollar sign and then the variable name or value for this. And so it's pretty, this is a, a great example of how to inject different values and expressions in your strings. Okay, and if you want to do if else statements, that's pretty much unchanged. We have a different uh, if statement, if statement as an expression, which again goes back to that equal sign uh, if statement this and so what this is doing is basically saying return the final value of this statement and that is going to take place of this function. All right, another thing that uh, Kotlin has over Java is the ability to safely check different types. Uh, this is a little bit of an improvement in my opinion of type checking here and so in this example we have a function get string length it's going to take any object or I should say a parameter of which is called obj and it is of any type and this is going to return an int but this int has a question mark and if you know anything about Swift this is very similar to the way that Swift works um, a little bit different syntax but uh, this is what it's saying is it has the ability this function to return null or to actually return an integer namely that object's length. And so the operator that this is explaining is that we're asking, well, if you're passing me an object of type string, then I can call dot length on it to see what the length is and get that attribute. Otherwise return null because I can't do anything with it. And so again, this integer could come back as null, meaning you didn't pass me a string or it could return an integer if it indeed is a string with a length. And then of course this example is just illustrating the fact that we can say not is, which is kind of an interesting way of putting this in English, but if this object is not a string, then return null, otherwise return the length. This is just an example of how to say the same exact thing in a different way. Okay, here's another example of a for loop. So this is a fast iteration loop or a for each loop, depending upon which language you have experience in. And so all this really does is iterate through the list of items, puts each one in the item and then prints out that that individual item here. Here's an exa another example of doing the same exact thing. So we're using indices on those items, putting that into an index, and that index will be 0, 1, 2, etc. And then we have the ability to get the item at index on that array. So pretty pretty typical if you have any experience with other languages. Next, we have a, a while loop, and this is pretty much the same as you might expect. We have the plus plus operator. Next, we have this really cool when expression. So when our object is one, we're going to return uh, the string one. When this object is of string hello, we return a string greeting. And so you can see that this function describe object of any type. So we can pass in any type, whether that's an int or a string. This function is going to return a string with this expression. And so it's, there's no return value, but this will evaluate to one of these items and then that will be re the return value in essence. Next, we can check if a number is within a range. And so we can ask is 10 in one through nine plus one or you know is X in one through nine. And then finally, in this example here, we have using collections. So again, we have the fast iteration. We had we have when values equal such return or do this. So in this example, when the string orange is in the collection items, then go ahead and print 
the string juicy. If the string apple appears in items, then we're going to print a line apple is fine too. And also in Kotlin, we have the ability to have Lambda expressions. So a very, very powerful, rich language. And as I mentioned before, this is very like Swift. And so I have this uh, blog that I found. And again, I'll put the link in the description below. But we can have a side-by-side -side comparison between Swift and Kotlin. And so if you ever wanted to get into iOS developer, if you're an Android developer, and you want to go ahead and learn Kotlin, well, those skills should transfer over very, very easily to both languages. So for example, in Swift, we have print and then the string. In Kotlin, it's print ln for print line, and then the same string format. And notice that there's no semicolons at the end of these languages. Next, we have variables and constants. So a variable in Swift is denoted by the var and the number 42. In this example, we can change that to 50. But if we want to have a constant, we call it let. So let my constant equal 42 is the way that you read that. In Kotlin, the equivalent would be var, my var equals 42. We change that var, so exactly the same as in Swift. Uh, the only thing that's a little bit different in Kotlin is we have a value, my constant equals 42. And so my constant would not be allowed to change after this declaration. Uh, explicit types. So Kotlin is a statically typed language, just as Swift is. We, we like our strongly typed languages. And so in this example, we have a let. Because usually we, we default to the let keyword as opposed to the var, and same thing with Kotlin. So we always want to try to make our variables uh, constant, if that makes sense, unless we need to change it, in which case then it is a variable. So I use those terms sometimes interchangeably. So explicit double, colon, this is the type. And in Kotlin, it is colon, double. And then in Kotlin, we do denote the, the, the doubles as 0. 0.0. In Swift, it is kind of assumed that, uh, is, that this is of type double. Therefore, we don't have to put the 0. 0.0. I actually prefer this method. But again, if you want to be explicit about it, Kotlin's going to be better in that method. Uh, type coercion, pretty much the same. The only difference is the difference between the let and the val keyword. And then in Swift, we specifically uh, typecast this uh, width, which is a number to a string so that we can cat catenate a string to a number. In Kotlin, it just kind of does it for you. So that's a little bit more implicit rather than Swift's explicit concatenation there, rather than Swift's type coercion. Okay, so string interpolation is essentially the ability to insert uh, variables into the different strings. And so the way that Swift does it is we put a backslash and then surround everything in parentheses. And we can even concatenate another string using the plus operator. The same exact example in Kotlin is instead of a backslash, it is a dollar sign and then uh, curly braces instead of parentheses. And then again, we can concatenate a completely different string onto this first string. So very, very similar methods of doing those operations. So the range operator Swift, we have an index variable that is going to go from zero to anything less than count. And count in this case is just four. So it essentially go from zero to less than three. And then in the Kotlin example, the syntax is very, very similar, except we don't have a less than operator, uh, but instead we use a minus one. And then we have the interpolation here that we insert our variables into our string and then print it out. So again, very, very similar. If we want to include the last index in that, namely five, in Swift, we add an extra dot in the range operator. So instead of just having the two dots and then five, which will go from one to four, if we wanted that index, namely this variable here, to go and include the number five, then you can see we did this five times. We include that extra dot there. And likewise in Kotlin, if you remember, we had to do the minus one before. Uh, Kotlin by default is inclusive in the range operator. And so by doing just the basic uh, range operator there, uh, we do get those five times one through five, one through five here. So hopefully that makes sense. So what's the difference between arrays? Well, pretty much not anything except for the fact that in Swift, we denote an array with uh, square brackets. And then for Kotlin, we uh, put everything in an array of. 
Likewise for maps, hash maps, dictionaries, whatever you want to call them, we do mutable map of, and then the list key, and then the value with this other two here, where that two is replaced with a semicolon in Swift, and again, the square brackets to denote that map. Separated by commas, however, I'm not really sure about that trailing comma if we need that in Swift. I think with the latest update of Swift, we don't, but don't quote me on that. So once we have this declared, how do we put in a new value uh, with key Jane into this occupations map? Uh, will we do it just this way with curly with square brackets and with Kotlin? It is exactly the same. So very, very similar languages, as you can tell. Okay, empty collections are, are pretty interesting as well. Uh, Swift has an interesting syntax here where in the square brackets we put string with a empty parentheses, whereas in Kotlin we do the same exact thing with array of and then this kind of template uh, operator here with string in there and then again empty parentheses. So again, kind of similar. And then if we have a dictionary of key string with a value of float, uh, we do it this way, and same thing with Kotlin, except for, again, we change it to use angle brackets here with a map of for the dictionary or the map or the hash map, whatever you, whatever you call it. And then functions. So in Swift, it's F-U-N-C. In Kotlin, it is F-U-N. Pretty much the same. Um, these are unnamed parameters, and you denote them as the same exact types by doing colon and then the type. Uh, the difference with Swift and Kotlin is we have this kind of arrow operator to say what we're returning, in this case a string, whereas Kotlin is just a semicolon. And then to call that function, again, same thing in Swift as it is in Kotlin. Tuples are an interesting feature of a language, and I'm glad that Kotlin has this in here as well. Uh, but if you have a function, get gas prices, what it allows you to do is actually return multiple return types. So for this one, it's returning three doubles, namely 359, 369, and 379. In Kotlin, we have to do something slightly different. Namely, we have to declare this gas prices item, uh, which takes these three values, put those three values in here, and then make it an expression that is set equal to this function, get gas prices. So not as nice as Swift, but we do have the ability to do that as well in Kotlin. Variable number of arguments is kind of interesting. If you don't know how many parameters you want to pass into a function, you can use this, uh, this operator here, which will essentially say, just give me a list of integers separated by comma. So in this case, we can pass in three, whereas they're just going to be numbers, and that's going to go into a, uh, a collection of numbers, which we can then iterate through using this for each or fast iteration for loop. Same thing with Kotlin. Instead of the triple periods, we use the variable argument keyword here, and then this numbers is going to be a collection of integers, and we can then iterate through that, and again, pass in multiple parameters. We can pass in three, we can pass in 20, and then what that'll do is just iterate through those three or 20. Okay, so sorting a list or an array in Swift, uh, we first declare that array, again, using the square brackets with a bunch of values in it, and then this variable we just call sort. In Kotlin, we're going to do list of, we declare right there, and then sorted. So do be careful about what you're actually calling sort on, whether that's going to mutate the actual value of the objects, or it's going to return a sorted list, which you then have to assign to another variable. Okay, so I talked about named variables, uh, but this is your function decoration with a width and a height that it's passing into, and it's returning an integer, and basically it's just going to get the area by... Uh, multiplying width and height. So when you call that function, the first parameter you name, namely width colon two, and then height. And so when you call this function, you know exactly what the first parameter is and the second parameter. And so I, I love this about both Objective-C and Swift. With Kotlin, we have something very, very similar where you can also do this as well with an equal sign instead of a, a colon. Uh, but it does look like these are optional. So for example, we don't need to put in the width here. It'll just assume it. And then if we name these backwards, because width is first and height is second, if we call this height comma width, Kotlin doesn't seem to care. And it'll put in those parameters in the appropriate values. All right, we have classes in Swift and in Kotlin. And as you can see, they pretty much look exactly the same. A few different characters here and there, but essentially the same. How you use them is, again, 
almost exactly the same. Uh, subclasses get a little bit more complicated. Uh, there's a couple keywords in here. So an open class in Kotlin versus just a regular class, which you then, uh, for your uh, subclass, you just say uh, colon and then the parent class and in Kotlin, and in Kotlin, you do a colon and then the uh, the original parent class, and you can pass in a parameter there. So a little bit different on this one, and this this will take me a little bit of time to get used to. Type checking we already talked about. Basically, it's going to have a keyword is, so you can check to see if this item is of type song, and exactly the same in Kotlin. Now, downcasting is a little bit different in Swift. We use the uh, the typecasting as, so we're going to say uh, the current object as a movie with this optional here. And in Kotlin, we're going to check first if that current type is a movie. And so there's no equivalent in Kotlin for the as here with the optional operator as well. Protocols. So in Java, these are known as interfaces. You can create an interface in Kotlin. In Swift, they're called protocols. So not a whole lot of difference there, just the, the naming of those items. And then extensions, extensions to classes. Now with Swift, we have to explicitly declare an extension on this double type at a parameter called km for kilometer. And what that function does is here, uh, meter to basically calculate that and a couple other functions that we can declare on the built-in type double. So this is a very powerful feature of the language. So in Kotlin, we just basically say the value for double.km is going to be a double, and we're going to use this function get to equal this expression, this, namely what the double value is, and then multiply that by a thousand to get the value in kilometers. And so how do we use that? You could just say any number, which is a double, so this can be a variable or an actual explicit value, and then dot mm, and so in this case, millimeters is going to divide it by a thousand. So whatever uh, 25.4 is gonna take the value of this divided by a thousand, that'll give you the millimeters and assign it to this value. So we can do the same thing with three. We can take three and create feet from it. And so for this example, feet uh, is apparently 3.28084 to convert that over. So very, very powerful ability to extend built-in classes or other classes that we have in our Swift or Kotlin libraries. So I hope you found this video useful. If you'd like to see more videos, make sure you subscribe to this channel, like this video, and head over to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash electronic armory. If you're new here, we have tutorials on all things electronic from native mobile development, software engineering, electrical engineering, and everything else to arm yourself in the digital world. More information is in the description below. And so again, I hope you found this useful and we'll see you next time. Thanks.